Rosenberg the 7th through the 10th of this month, and also one in Alvin the 4th through the 7th. There should be announcements on the rear for those uh, over on the rear board on the side if you would like additional information on those meetings, who's speaking, the times, that sort of thing. For our order of services this morning, Brother Jeffrey will have the opening prayer right after I finish with the announcements. Brother Byron will have the song leading this morning. Uh, Brother Wayne will be heading up the table and assisting him will be Brother David, Brother Jason, Brother Brent, and Brother J.D. Brother Rick will have the lesson this morning, and when the time comes, Brother Mickey Bennett will have our closing prayer. We'll turn it over to Brother Timber. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day. Father, we come to you in prayer in your Son, Christ Jesus' name. Father, be with us as we go through this service, that we incline our ears to hear your gospel truth. And we ask that you be with Brother Moore as he ministers your word to us. And Father, let us apply our word, your word to our lives, that we be a, a vessel, good stewards of your word, to spread throughout our community. <coughs> and Father, I ask that you lift up the hearts and spirits of those who are not with us, sick and the shut-in, and those who are traveling, and those who are working. And Father, I ask that you be with us in this journey, because I know we're in the last hours, and in this time that we have to follow you and serve you to reach salvation. And Father, I just ask that you be with our leaders in our nation, and Father, I ask you to forgive us of our many sins. Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Yeah. 
Christ's death on the cross and gather around the Lord's table this morning. Before we do this, let's read a little scripture to uh, uh, in Matthew, the 26th chapter, verse 26, starting. And let's read a little bit of how we're supposed to partake of the Lord's Supper. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until, I, until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. At this time, I have a man come forward. <coughs> Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this bread, which, which represents Christ's body that suffered and died on the cross. As we partake of this bread, let us remember that great sacrifice that was made. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, we will thank for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents us as Christians, Christ's blood that is shed on the cross. We pray, Lord, that you can't get the loose on the man who is pleasing that it be with proper hearts and proper minds. They should visit our sin. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
this concludes the Lord's Supper. We have another commandment, that is to lay by and store and, and uh, give as we will prosper. And we can read about this in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints as we directed the churches in Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you put aside and save as he has prospered, that no collection be made until I come. We'll have the prayer. Pray with me. Lord God in heaven, for 15 or 20 minutes now, I've been wondering what words might come to mind that wouldn't make a feeble prayer by comparison. When I, when I look at the number of blessings that we have in this life, and try to find enough words to express gratitude for that much love and, and the amount of good things that you've given us. There just aren't human words to express enough gratitude to even compare. We live in the greatest country in the world that's full of life and food and good health and blessings just abound in every turn. And we're so grateful to you for every good thing that you've given us. Help us to be grateful. Help us to remember that all things come from you, to give back as you have given so richly to us. Watch over our elders as they see to the use of these funds that are collected. Help your church grow in the direction you want it to grow, and preferably in great magnitude, Father. That's what we desire is to have your kingdom grow and thrive. In Jesus' name, amen. you want.
268 will be the song of invitation. When you get your songbook marked, be turning your Bibles to the book of Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis chapter 1. Good to have you here today. We have a number of uh, sick people, a number of people that are not here, so keep them in mind and let's uh, check up on them. We have a young man with us this morning. His name is Zach Miller. Zach is sitting on the back row, kind of a shy young fella. He's good friends with the Hardings. And I want to let you know that uh, Thursday night about 10 o'clock, he obeyed the gospel and was baptized. We had a good number of people here, his family, and so uh, get to know him and meet him. He's been here visiting several times, but uh, make him welcome. I want to talk this morning and tonight about how does God speak to us? How does God tell us what he wants us to do? I've been preaching now a little over 35 years. Uh, I was trying to do some private studies with people for five to seven years before that, so most of my adult life, I've been having private Bible discussions and conversations with people, and uh, I've heard some of the strangest things, and I've heard them over and over and over again. Here's one thing I've heard. Rick, the Bible's not a technical manual. Why are you so focused on the details? Why do you look at every word and look at every detail? I've had mass quantities of people tell me the Bible was a love letter. It was not designed for us to look at details. I've other had people say, I read my Bible and I love it, but I'm going to tell you that book was 2,000 years old. And it doesn't really, most of it doesn't apply to us today. So what I want to do, <clears throat> partially because we are finishing the Old Testament, we will uh, flip-flop our singing, and so we will have Bible class. We will be studying Nehemiah 7 and 8 on Wednesday night, the next two Sundays, and we're moving into the New Testament. Now, those of you that have been here regularly, we've been on the, New, the Old Testament for three years. We're <coughs> Dead batteries. I said Sunday night that Shelby doesn't like to get in front of people and look at what happens. <laughs> All right, so we'll use the other, other uh, microphone for a little while. So what I want to do is today, morning and evening, I want to talk about how does God tell us what he wants? In what format does the information come? And I would suggest to you that from the beginning of time, the book of Genesis was written by Noah. Moses, rather, written by Moses about 3,500 years ago, but the material in Genesis 1 is somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 years old. Now, I want you to think about, here is the New Testament around zero time period. Moses lived around 1,500 years before that. He's the man that wrote this, but he's dealing with the beginning of time. And I will tell you that the world is somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 years old. So literally from the beginning of time, how did God tell us what he wanted us to know? How did he tell us what he expected of us? So I want to begin taking a look at Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to start with me looking at... Verses 1 through 25, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. We have people from time to time, and you'll, I can remember some years ago going through a, a cave in San Marcos, Texas, and uh, the, uh, the young man there who was from the university was telling everybody that this cave was 100 million years old in San Marcos, Texas. It may have been. I don't know. I do know that the world was covered with water two times. The first two verses tell you that, uh, look at verse 2. The earth was formless or waste and emptiness. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. So for some period of time, you can tell me it was 100 years, you can tell me it was a billion years, I don't know. 
I know that there was a period of time that this earth that we live on was just covered in water and it was completely formless and void until God began to create something out of it. And he says the Spirit of God was over the surface of the deep. So people will say, well, in the time of Noah, the world was covered with water. I'm going to tell you, that was the second time. It was covered with water before the events of Genesis chapter 1 got started. So you can see in verse 3 where God says, let there be light. And there was light. In verse 5, he called the, the light day and the darkness he called night. And that was an evening and a morning. One day, that was the first day. In verse 6, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from waters. And he made the expanse and separated the waters where we where were below in the expanse of the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse of heaven, and that was the second day. The idea being this. Think about there being a ball here, and it's completely covered in water. So what God does is, did is, he comes in and he takes some of that water, and he makes it the waters above. And so he separated the waters above from the waters below. This is what we call atmosphere. We have three heavens talked about in the Bible. This is the first heaven. This is the air that we breathe. It's where the birds fly. It was the second, it was the first heaven. If somebody wants to know why our humidity here is 100 plus percent, so oftentimes, in fact, it's been well over 100 percent for the last month. But why is it that when you see the high here being 95 degrees and the low that night 85 degrees, and you go to Phoenix, Arizona, the high is 110, and at night it's 60? Well, we've got a whole lot better blanket than they have over our bed. So this is the waters above from the waters below. So God separated those. Now, you go through every single day, and what I want to talk about is this. God was, uh, Moses was specifically uh, in detail talking about how God did what he did and on what day he did it. A little bit further, so if you look at that, verses 26 and 7, after God made everything. And he looks at verse 31 and he says, God saw everything that he made. So on day one, he looked at it, it was good. Day two, he looked at it, it was good. Day six, he looked at it, it was good. In verse 31, he says it was very good. At the end of that, God says, I'm going to make human beings. I first made a place for them to live. I built them a house, and that house is this world that we live on today. But in verse 26, 27, and 28, at the end of the sixth day, or the latter part of that day, he says, God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over all cattle and all earth and all creeping things that creep on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him and made him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every living creature that moves on the earth. So after God created the world, he created the garden, he now created mankind. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 6, <clears throat> they had not seen rain. The water was a, a mist, it says. The mist used to rise up from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul or a living being. When you think about being made in the image of God that Moses talked about, there are two parts to a human being. I can tell you that when a baby is born right here, that baby has a body and a soul. <clears throat> Just like God breathed into the first man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living spirit or a living soul. When this child dies one of these days, Ecclesiastes 12, 7 tells us what death is. What death is, the body goes where? It goes to the ground where it came from, the same place that Adam's body came from. That's where our body came from. And the spirit goes back to God who gave it. 
Now we have all of this details about just the beginning of time. And I can tell you, I, I have not covered anywhere close to all of it. In Genesis 1.28, God said, I'm going to give man jobs. I'm going to give him jobs that he has to do. In chapter 1 and verse 28, here was the first job that God gave him. He said to him, he's, God blessed him and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That was their first job. Why didn't God make uh, 50 million people at the same time he made Adam? Could he have? Could God have made babies grow on trees and you just go out and pick one? Could he have babies fall out of the sky? He could have done it any way he wanted to, but he chose a very specific way. The human race today that seven and a half billion people started with two people. And I will tell you, after the flood of Noah, it went back to eight people. God could, could basically fill this earth any way he wanted to, but he gave that job to man. Look at this a little bit further. In verses uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Lord God planted a, a garden in the east of Eden, and there he placed man which he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing in his sight and good for food, and the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The second job, if you read a little bit further down in verse uh, 15, God put him to work cultivating and tilling the garden. So the first job that God gave the human being was to have children, be fruitful and multiply. The second job was, I built a garden here and it's your job to take care of it. But there's a third thing that he's going to uh, tell him to do in verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was his name. That's going to be his third job. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Take care of the garden that I gave to you. And number three, it's your job to look at every single animal that I've created and I have I built them. And you look at them and you tell me what you're going to call them, Adam. And whatever you call them, I, that's what I'll call them. And he might have looked at their teeth. He might have looked at their hoofs. He might have felt of them. But somehow he came up with a name. God had a plan. You know what the plan was when he wanted Adam to look at every single animal in the garden? Here is the summary. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. God already knew that. But Adam didn't know it. So he needed Adam to do this exercise to realize, hey, I can have a dog and that dog will lick my face and I can have a horse that I ride and I can have an elephant that will pull a tree over, but none of them are like me. And the first time, he says in verse 18, it is not good. And he says it's not good for a man to be alone. Now when you take a look in verse 22, chapter 2 and verse 22, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which was taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. There are about a dozen couples sitting here that I did your wedding once upon a time. And this is pretty common for me to say. The first, uh, first wedding ceremony ever happened in the Garden of Eden. And if somebody had said, who brings this woman to this man? Who would say I do? Or who would say me? God. God brought the woman to the man. Now, Adam has the job of naming her. He has the, the ability to do that. And so now we're going to look at his, his research. He says in verse 23, the man said, this is now bone of my bones. Why would he say that about Eve? Where'd she come from? A bone of his bones. That's, he's, he's giving you his research. A bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That's what the word woman means, taken out of man or from man. Now what I would tell you is, do you know that in all of this, look at the detail <clears throat> about this one event. He even tells them what trees they can eat of and what trees they can't eat of. Of every tree in the garden, what did he say? You can eat of it except... One, do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
Let me tell you something. There's a principle here that is laid out throughout the Bible all the way to the Revelation, and that is if a, a person does not know good or evil, they cannot sin. We have conversations about what happens when a child passes from this life. If that child was not old enough to know right from wrong, they had no ability to sin. If somehow a person is mentally impaired to where they don't have cognitive skills, they can't sin. Do you know Adam and Eve could not sin until they ate of that tree? That's why God didn't want them to do it. It also represented choice. I'm going to give you one thing and tell you you can't do it, and that represents choice. You're either going to follow me or not follow me. Let's move a little further into Genesis chapter 6. So if you, and, and I just hit the high point, the tops of the mountain. Incredible details about how the world was made. Incredible details about the job that he gave mankind. Details about how babies are born and why. Details about the food that they can eat. <coughs> In Genesis chapter 6, <clears throat> the world has now been around for a while. The story of Noah is around 2500 B.C., about 1,000 years before Moses. And the world has already been around two, three 3,000 years, something like that. And God is looking on the earth, and he's not happy with what he's seeing. So in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, God tells us what he's thinking. And he says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent and every thought of his heart was only evil continually. I think about this passage a lot for this reason. We talk about, especially those of us who are 30 years of age or older or 25 or older, where you've lived long enough, you've seen 20 years, you think, man, the world is getting so bad. The world is getting so bad, it's terrible. I would tell you, I don't think we're anywhere close to the time of Noah, where every human being, every single thought was evil all the time. But that's what God said was the, the state of the world at this time. In verse 6, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man that I have created from the, the land, from man to animal, to creeping things, to bird of the sky, for I am sorry that I made them. So Noah prepared for us and delivered to us how God was thinking. What made the first flood happen? It wasn't bad luck. It wasn't coincidence. We know exactly how God was thinking. In verse 8 it said, But Noah found favor in his eyes. In verse 9, These are the records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. He stood head and shoulders above any other human being in his time. And that's why God gave him the job that he did. Do you know in verse 14 he gives him a job? Make an ark. Does he allow Noah to make any kind of ark he wants to make? Yes or no? Yeah. How much detail does he give you? Incredible detail. I want you to look at this with me. Genesis 6 and 14. What are we dealing with here? We're dealing with how does God transfer his mind to us? How does he tell us what he wants? We're going to tonight be looking at the New Testament. In verse 14, he says, Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Now, why didn't they use cedar? Cedar was the common wood around where they would be, and it wasn't all that common. They lived in the desert area. But make it out of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms, and you, you shall cover it with, in and out with pitch. We would call that tar. And this is how you shall make it. Its length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window, one window, and with a, a, for the ark, and finish it a cubit from the top. And set the door of the ark on the side, and you shall make a lower, second, and third deck. Behold, I'm bringing a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Let's just stop for a moment. Did God tell Noah how big to build the ark? Did he tell him how many rooms? Did he tell, me, tell him how many floors? Did he tell him how many windows? Did he tell him how many doors? Did he tell him... Intricate details cover this with pitch. 
Now I'm guessing that this is the first boat Noah ever built. I don't know that for sure, but it's a pretty good chance. <clears throat> God knows how many animals he's going to bring on this boat, and he's telling Noah how big the boat needs to be and how many floors. Now we go a little bit further in this, and here's what happened. <clears throat> when you take a look at Genesis chapter 6, verses 19, you're going to see he was to bring aboard two of every single animal that lived on the face of the earth. And the purpose was, if you take a look at this, to verse 20, you can see verse 19 and 20. Look at verse 19. Every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every kind on the ark to keep them alive with you. In verse 20, of the birds after their kind, and animals after their kind, and every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. Now let me tell you why he's stressing all of these animals were to be kept alive, because there were going to be other animals that were not going to be kept alive. Look in chapter 7. Chapter 7, he says in verse 2, you shall take with you every clean animal by sevens, a male and a female, and an animal that are not clean, uh, two males and one female. All the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive. Verse 7, for seven more days I will send rain on the earth. Forty days and forty nights I will blot them out. In verse 5, Noah did as the Lord commanded. You see in verses 1 through 5, there were animals that were on the boat to be eaten. Okay? They were not there to be kept alive. You can see that in some detail. That, uh, I believe is where the seven come from. At least that's my take of it. After the flood, what happens after the flood? I'm going to tell you. The period of time after the flood, the world changed tremendously. I'm going to give you one example of how it changed. This is something that I go over when I'm teaching people the Bible. And I want you to understand this. This is a graph of how long human beings live. Anybody know how long Adam lived, the first man? 930 years. Can somebody tell me who was the oldest living man? Methuselah. Anybody know how old Methuselah was? 969. Somebody's doing their research. So Methuselah lived just before, in fact, probably a generation before the flood. We have the flood. After that, people start living tremendously shorter and shorter periods of time from 600 years to 250 years, in the case of Abraham's father, to Abraham 175 years. You come down here to the time of Moses. Moses lived 120 years. You come down here to 1000 BC, the period of time of King David. Moses makes a, uh, Moses in Psalm 90 says, if a man live, anybody know that verse? Three score and ten, or reason of health, four score years. What in, in our day and time, how long was Moses saying the average man was going to live? 70 to, 70 to 80 years. The last 3,500 years, the average person lived 75 to 80 years. We have built hospitals, we have built urgent care centers, there are more of them than there are McDonald's and Dairy Queen. We have got medication and doctors. How long does the average man today live, man and woman? 70 to 80 years. But this happened after the flood. Let me show you something else that happened after the flood. Things changed tremendously. In chapter 9 and verse 1, chapter 9 and verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you, this is very different. The fear of you and the terror of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky. With everything that creeps on the ground and the fish of the sea, into your hand they are given. I want to just stop for a minute. In Genesis chapter 2, how did Noah get giraffes and hippopotamuses and rhinoceroses and tigers and lions onto the ark. 
How did he get them on there? They came to him. They came to him. That's what Genesis 2 says. After the flood, he says, I'm going to put the fear of animals, uh, of fear of human beings in the animals. Also, he says, in verse 3, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. Had it been food for them before the flood? He's going to show you in a minute, all the way back to Genesis 1. Look at what he says here. Verse 3, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. If you turn back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29, you're going to see that for thousands of years, every human being ate plants. Genesis 1 and 29, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has been fruit yielding, it shall be food for you. And every beast of the earth, and every bird of the sky, and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for you. But what happened after the flood? After the flood, God says two things. I'm going to make all animals afraid of human beings. And number two, I'm going to give you all of them to eat. Quite a change. He says this in chapter 9 and verse 5. Don't eat the flesh with its life. Any of you that are hunters, you know what it's, what it's talking about when you bleed an animal out. Don't eat the blood. Now he says this, uh, in taking a look a little bit further. <clears throat> Both animals and human beings were protected by God by covenant. Now, most of you know, you've studied somewhere in your life, that the rainbow represents something. When you see a rainbow, I was looking on Facebook a while back, and someone took a picture of three rainbows showing up at the same time. Never saw anything like it. What did the rainbow represent? That God would never again destroy the world with water. Here's the trick question. Who did he make that covenant with? I want you to look at this with me for a minute. In Genesis chapter 9, in verse 12, Genesis 9 and 12, and God said, this is a sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I will set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of covenant between me and you and it shall come about when I see the cloud over the earth, I will bow down uh, shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember the covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Who did God make this covenant with now? Everything on earth. Every single thing on earth. Every man and every animal. Well, let's go a little bit further now. So look at the detail. And I'm skipping, skimming over the top. But do you see the incredible detail that God gives us about what he was thinking and why he did what he did in Exodus the 12th chapter. In Exodus chapter 12, the next big thing that God wanted human beings to build. I've always found it a little bit curious why God didn't just have things fall out of the sky. Why did he always have human beings build it? Why did he have human beings a part of the process always? From the having of children, we have a number of young ladies here that are about to have children. That's how God set it up from the beginning of time, and he tells us that in detail. Genesis chapter 12, uh, Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus 12 and 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It shall be the first month of the year. Speak to all the congregation, saying, On the tenth of this month, each of you are to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Verse 5, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, one year old, that you may take it from, uh, or you may take it from sheep or goats. Without going into detail, they were about to have a celebration. God tells them the day of the month. He tells them what kind of animal they can use. He tells them how old the animal is to be. 
He tells them that it is to be without blemish. Do you know how long this feast lasted? It lasted till the time of Jesus Christ. Now, people might say, but that was so long ago. That was so long ago. If I'm going to tell you, in the period of time we're studying, we're sitting here at 600 years before Christ, 500 years before Christ. What we're studying right now in the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, a thousand years after Moses wrote this law. Did details matter to the people who were coming back to form this nation that had been wiped out? You better believe it. A thousand years didn't mean anything to God. The details matter. But you can see, he made the decision that he was going to destroy the nation of, of Egypt. <clears throat> there were ten plagues. The tenth plague, the last and final plague, was what? Can somebody tell me what the tenth plague was? The death of every firstborn animal and human that did not have blood over their door. Now, I'm going to show you that in just a minute. So he says to them, I want you to take this lamb on this particular night, and I want you to take the blood and put it into a, a vessel. And I want you to take a little hyssop bush, and I want you to, to paint the top of your door with this blood. And I want you to stay in your house. Do not go out of your house at this night. You stay in the house. Now, here's what he says in chapter 12, verse uh, 13. And the blood shall be a sign for you on your house where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover came from. The offering of the Passover lamb. It started, uh, you can see it earlier part of this. And no plague, verse 13, will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 13 and verse Let's take a look at verse 7, Exodus 13 and 7. Verse 6, six days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the seventh day there shall be a feast. Verse 7, unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days. He wanted their system purged of leaven. So for seven days before you eat nothing but leaven shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in, in your, your borders. And you shall tell your sons on that day, saying, it is because the Lord did for me what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be serve as a sign to you on your hand and remembrance on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. With a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. In verse 14, this is a powerful passage. And when your sons... Ask you in time to come saying, what is this? What are you doing, Dad? I don't understand. What is happening here? What is this? Then you will say to him with a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And it came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both firstborn of man and firstborn of beast. In verse 16, it will serve as a sign, even... Even the most powerful man in the world, his son died that very same night. So you had a period of time here in the capital of Egypt where there was a division. Over here were where the slaves or the Hebrews lived. Over here were where the Egyptians lived. That night when the Lord passed over, every single house that had blood over the door, what did he do for it? He passed over it. Every single uh, house that there was no blood on it, what happened? The firstborn of every child and every animal died. Did it matter that these people over here didn't believe in God? Did it make any difference? No, it made no difference at all. The wailing and the crying was so loud, it was deafening over here. When the Lord passed over but he went into great detail telling them, how do you avoid this problem? <clears throat> Tremendous detail. You slaughter the animal like, you, like I told you. You put the blood here. You, you transfer the blood to your door and you stay in your house because the blood was the coverage. It was the safety. And he talked about that in great detail. 
Exodus chapter 25. Here's the next thing that God decided he wanted built. So around nine months after the time that the children of Israel had crossed over the Red Sea, and they had gone down to the southern part, what's called the Negev, or south country. So you think about, here's a picture of the Sinai Peninsula, and Mount Sinai right here. From the, where they crossed the Red Sea, here's the Jordan River. So this took them around nine months. They will spend close to a year down here in the bottom part <laughs> near Mount Sinai. I want you to look with me in Exodus chapter 25. So what he's doing is these people had been slaves for 430 years. But they leave with all kinds of stuff. Like they had won a war. Nine months later, God tells them, I want you to do something. What I want you to do is give back to me what you want to give back. You can give back or not. It will be a free will offering. I want you to look at this in verse, this is... Chapter 25 and verse 2. Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man whose heart moves him. You shall raise my contribution, and this shall be the contribution that you raise. Gold, silver, bronze, purple, uh, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair, ram skin, dyed red uh, porpoise skins, acacia wood, on and on and on. Was he detailed about what he wanted them to give? Incredible detail. Verse 9. According to all that I'm going to show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furnishings, so you shall construct it. And they shall construct an ark of acacia wood. So he tells them exactly the dimensions you'll see here in just a moment. In verse 10. Here's an ark made of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, one cubit and a half cubit wide, and one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and out you shall overlay it, and you shall make the gold molding around it. What is this? What do we call this today? The Ark of the Covenant. This was the Ark of the Covenant, the first building of it. In verse 12, you shall cast four gold rings on it, and fasten them on the four feet, two rings on one side, two on the other. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles in the rings on all sides of the sides of the ark to carry the ark. In verse 16, you shall put the ark of the testimony which I shall give you. And you shall make the mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one uh, uh, cubit, uh, one half cubit wide. And you shall make two cherubim of gold and make them of hammered work all the ends of the mercy, at the end of the mercy seat. You can go through here the next number of chapters and look at the incredible details. God said, I want you to make a couple of lamps that would look something like this. He told them exactly what he wanted the ends to look like. He told them he wanted exactly a certain type of pole. He told them exactly where the oil was to come from to keep these going. Does this surprise you? that he gave that kind of detail. And you can read over and over by chapter 28. They're going to make, uh, they're going to make a uniform for the first high priest. His name was uh, Aaron. Intricate detail on what his uniform was to look like. Why? Why did God use that kind of detail? Let's go a little bit further. The table, lampstand, the pattern. Now, people say oftentimes, yeah, but, you know, that was the Old Testament. God was like that in the Old Testament, but he wasn't. He's not like that in the New Testament. The passage I just read to you from Exodus chapter 25 is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. So Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, he's going to go through detail talking about what all of these things to mean to Christians. But he said, to the Hebrew writer said, God, quoting the passage I just showed you, make all things according to the pattern. Now let's look at a couple more things before our time runs out. Do you know that when David comes to God and he says, I want to build you a house. God, I want to build you a house. God says to David, why haven't you built me one already of cedar? 
I guess David would have said, well, I didn't think about it. I've been busy killing people. I've been busy in war. But the first thing he asked him, if you look at these several verses, is why haven't you already built me a house? The Ark of the Covenant had been sitting in a temporary location for a long, or several hundred years by now. Now here's something else I want to talk about. Right in here, God lays out the plan for David's descendants, and he says, I'm not going to let you build a house. I'm not going to let you build a house, but I will let your son build a house. So David pleaded with him, and he said to David, I will give you the ability to collect the people that will be the craftsmen, and I'll give you the ability to collect, to collect the thing, the wood and the stone, but you will not build it. Somebody know why God wouldn't let, build, uh, let David build a temple? Now here's what's interesting. You don't read that in 1 Samuel or 1 Kings. 1 Chronicles 22 and verse 8. I want you to turn there with me. I want to show you where that, that information comes from. You're exactly correct. About a dozen of you said it. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. I want to show you because he doesn't, the God, when he lays out the details of the temple for Solomon, he doesn't say that. 1 Chronicles 22 and verse 8. Beginning in verse 6, 1 Chronicles 22 and 6, David is about to die. He is on his deathbed, about to breathe his last breath. He called for his son Solomon. This is 1 Chronicles 22 and 6. He called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, my son, I had intended to build a house to the name of the Lord my God, but the word of the Lord came to me saying, you, shall, you have shed too much blood and have waged great wars. You will not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood on the earth before me. Behold, a son shall be born to you and who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all of his enemies on every side, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give him peace. So where does that information come from? David has a private conversation with Solomon to explain to him in detail why David said, I wanted to build it. I, I brought it up to the Lord, had multiple conversations with him, but God said, you're not the man. I'll let your son build it. Tremendous detail. <clears throat> when you go through and you take a look at, I'm going to tell you there's more detail about the building of the temple far more than the building of the tabernacle. When you look at it, exactly the size of everything, what it is to look like, every single filigree, every single little piece of thing that is, that is that cast or hammered, uh, every single thing in detail. The question is, you see here, if you do what I say I'm going to, if I tell you, I will accept this building that you're building for me, Solomon, and I will accept it as long as you do what I tell you I'm going to do. Do what I tell you to do, I meant to say. Do you know what these passages, I think you can guess, what did God tell Solomon before he ever accepted this temple? What did he tell him was going to happen if your people turn away from me? I'm going to burn it to the ground. I'm going to destroy this building. That's what we've been studying for the last year. God told Solomon that about himself and his descendants before he ever accepted it. Before he accepted that. I'm going to talk about this this evening for just a moment. Our time is up. <clears throat> the question I want to leave you with is this. Why did God give us such incredible, incredible detail about the building of the, the world in Genesis 1, <clears throat> about the work of man in Genesis 2, about where children were going to come from, from? Why did he tell us in detail why he was going to bring the flood? Why did he talk about in great detail the size of the boat? What kind of lumber was going to be in the boat? How many floors, three floors? One door, one, uh, one window, 
three cubits from the top. Why all of that detail? Why is it when people got off of the boat, when the water had gone down, why did he lay out in detail what they were going to eat? The tabernacle, incredible detail. The temple, incredible detail. This evening I want to talk about the church that Jesus Christ died for and built. Does it make sense to you that with all the incredible detail I've given you on a few things, that in our day and time, he just pretty much leaves it up to our discretion. Does that make sense to you? Does it make sense to you that God just sort of lets us run things the way we want to run them and whatever we say is fine? And God's kind of like a little puppy. You know, he's so starved for attention. You can kick this dog. You can starve this little dog. And he's, he's just so happy for you to come home. If that's the feeling that you have of God... You hadn't read your Bible. There's not a chance on earth that God used this incredible detail for thousands of years. And when it came to the, the crown jewel of what he built, the manifold wisdom of God was made known through what? The church. Ephesians 3.10. So you think that the manifold wisdom of God is made known through something and he just left it completely up to us to do what we want to do. Come back tonight, and we will talk about this in some detail, beginning with the pre the pre planning for the birth of Jesus Christ. That's where I want to start in Luke chapter one. So we have a song this morning that Brother Byron is going to lead us in. It will be our song of encouragement. We always have the ability to help you in any way possible. If you have not been baptized, then you have sin in your life. We talked about this in detail last week. Your sins have separated you from God. Let God take away those sins. Do you know the Passover lamb for you and me is who? Who is the Passover lamb? So all the way back to the time of Moses, 3,500 years ago, Moses told them, you slaughter a perfect, unblemished lamb, and you put his blood, the blood of that animal, you put it in a basin. What do you think would happen if they never put that blood over their door? What would have happened to that family? If you didn't make application to the blood by applying it to your house, the slaughter of the animal was completely worthless to you, right? How do we apply the blood of the, over the Passover lamb to us today? By being baptized in Jesus Christ, by approximating his death in baptism and coming up to be a new creature. There are times that we've done things that we shouldn't do and we need help getting back. And we're here to help pray for you and work with you in any way we can. Let it be known as we stand together and sing. The gentle voice of Jesus calling tenderly upon your ear. Sweet his cry of love and pity calleth. Turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon.
worship. That's some fine lessons that we've heard. And we've edified each other. And we've sang praises to God and prayed to God. And uh, it's been wonderful. Are there any announcements that need to be made before we are dismissed? If not, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Shall we pray? Our most heavenly and gracious Father, thank you for the blessing that you've given us. Thank you for sending us your son who died on a cross so we might have everlasting life. Please be with those that are sick. Bring them back to their most wanted health if that is thy wish. Be with the ones that are traveling. Bring them back to their destination safely. Be with those that are work and bring them back home to their loved ones. Thank you for this sunshiny day. We appreciate that. Uh, we thank you for the uh, blessings. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.